they're in this predicament is because a lot of the manufacturer uh, manufacturing has been stripped. Um, and they're not making these things. They've gone other places and, uh, GAD and NAFTA, uh, have hit them. Well, not a big surprise. Well, there's a lot of people that are wanting to push for Puerto Rico to become the 51st state. Now, remember Puerto Rico, it's not a state and it's not a state of the union yet. So they can't be seated. Uh, so they're heading to Washington. Now, Puerto Rican residents, they reinforced the push of a non-binding vote of statehood on, what was it, June 11th. Uh, Resident Commissioner Jennifer Gonzalez Collin, Puerto Rico's non-voting representative in Congress, called the 97% vote a clear mandate for statehood in a statement from her office. Puerto Rico, however, would need the support of Congress and the president to become a state. And without that recognition the uh, move to uh, seat representative is uh it's dicey it'll be interesting to hear they're going to be heard today actually say the uh, presence in dc may uh, commence a process that could end up in legislation or another vote he said uh there's a lot of folks man that just don't think that this thing's going to come out in national uh, committee chairman Tom Perez, the first Latino elected chairman of the DNC, is uh, endorsing the push. Not a surprise. That's who I'm referring to. Gonzalez is proposing the bill that uh, calls for the president to issue a proclamation recognizing Puerto Rico as the 51st state. Now, the bill has attracted 95 Democrats, 95, 14 Republicans and one independent as co-sponsors, but no vote has been scheduled. Representative Don Young of Alaska and Soto are also working on a statehood bill after their travel to Puerto Rico to observe the recent referendum. But for now, Puerto Rico is only represented by the resident commissioner who can weigh in on the bills but cannot cast official votes. So it's called the Equality Plan. This is another uh, component of Puerto Rico's leaders they hope to use towards getting representation. This law is one of the tools that they will utilize to validate a uh, majority of the claim of people uh, of Puerto Rico in favor of decolonizing of the island. But uh, it's $70 billion. They've had to raise taxes. Raise them. And people were not liking it very much at all because you go over there and, you know, your dollar can stretch a little bit. But now it's really hard on residents over there. You go into the Walmart or different places over there and you got to jack the prices up and people are not spending the money. Now, there's a lot of rich folks, some middle class. The middle class is not uh, not huge over there by any means, but there are people that do have money over there. I uh, have some beautiful houses. But uh, since the island had to raise the taxes, man, and a huge increase, they're just not happy campers by any means. But we'll we'll keep on looking at this. Uh, that would mean that, uh, gosh, hundreds of thousands of flags would actually have to be sewn on another star. What do you think about that? What do you think about having a 51st state? Do you think it's uh, worthwhile? Is it about time? Should we do it? Well, weigh in on Facebook at For the People Show, or you can just access it at For the People Show.com. For the People Show.com. Let me know what you think. Should Puerto Rico become a 51st state? What say you? I want to hear from America today, so uh, let me know. Uh, on the website, that would be good, or thepeopleshow.com, or on uh, on Facebook, and let others kind of weigh in on it. And uh, don't be don't be afraid. Just uh, let us know what your your thoughts are about this very, very thing. Now, very interesting. I should mention this before we transition uh, into this uh, next story that you're going to be uh, probably somewhat amused. Some of you guys might find this painful. Uh, but 
supposedly the 97% vote, which some of these uh, folks in Puerto Rico are saying not a lot of people voted for this. A lot of people didn't come out. They were swimming. They did everything else. But this was not a huge vote. So I am thinking if a lot of people didn't come out, didn't take this seriously, is this a real representation of the millions of Puerto Ricans that live there? And I've talked I've spoken to some folks that, uh, you know, know what's kind of going over there. They said that the vote tally was not accurate. So it's probably going to have to be uh, redone because they don't believe that this is a representation right now. See, the, the, the debt issue is the major issue. $70 billion public debt right now. And it yet to show signs of improvement, even after raising the taxes. It's combined with uh, expectation that the territory's admission would bolster Democratic numbers in Congress and leaves little incentive for majority Republicans to endorse statehood, uh, mainly because of the amount of debt um, to get them out of there. But uh, it is a shame because a lot of the beaches over there do not get the attention that they once did. And, uh, you know, they're just not very uh, uh, keeping the grounds as nice as they did. And that was a time where you go over there and all those beaches were. But the money is just not available anymore. So, again, we'll keep our eye on it. I know some people that are for it. I know some people that are against it, don't like it. Um, you know, there's the pros and cons. But, you know, if you could get bailed out. And right into the budget and add to the, what's what the heck? It's a billion dollars when you're trillions of dollars into debt. Something's going to have to uh, to give over there. It's definitely a beautiful place, though. There's just uh, no doubt about it. It's sad that there's, there's the problems that are going on there. But you can only brush it aside for so long. And um, I think a lot of the, the locals feel like they've been used uh, as far as the island goes. And um, they just feel like they've been taken advantage of and a lot of the uh, politics that have been going on and uh, decisions that have been made have affected them adversely economically from a lot of the policies that have caused these issues, if I understand it correctly. All right. A Florida man. Why does it always happen in Florida? I mean, I guess it makes sense for me to do the broadcast from Tampa, Florida. But there was a man from Florida that suffered a self-inflicted bullet. Uh, injury you know accident it was an accident but he shot himself in his penis <laughs> i'm not even kidding ouch um local outlets report that the man uh may now face criminal charges for possessing the gun in the first place a man from florida suffered a self-inflicted bullet after accidentally shooting himself in the piece this was the head <laughs> this was the headline they, uh, he sat down and, uh, he, unbeknownst to him, he sat down, the thing went off, boom. He was rushed to the hospital. Uh, they were able to stop the bleeding, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but he didn't know they were sitting down on it. So how I, he's, it was his gun. Apparently the way this uh, story reads, it was his gun. Uh, and that's about it. Not, not much more information. But I guess he did not realize that he had sat it where it was. That's a heck of a place to get shot, by the way. Wow. Hope that heals rather fast. This is a kind of a shame. Uh, folks came out in Arizona, um, obviously, like most people did around the country, to enjoy a beautiful Independence Day fireworks show. And a lot of people had their cameras going. And there was a huge explosion. And there was a big blaze, according to ABC 13. Uh, the fire department had to come out. And uh, the blaze was caused by a firework, which went off early. It was premature firework. And it landed into the brush. You know, things were really dry out there in Arizona. And uh, they were able to get everything under control. And it was a good thing. But he said... Uh, this is one of the fire marshals out there. About a half acre was damaged during the whole deal, but it was definitely a lot more uh, than people bargained for. Um, seeing this uh, big picture of this fireworks show uh, on on somebody's camera here, 
Uh, said it happened about 9.20 Pacific time uh, when this thing went down. But uh, thank, thankfully, they were able to, again, get the uh, fire extinguished. And uh, it was the Buckskin Fire Chief who uh, actually posted this picture. Thank you very much for the picture. Looks like everybody's okay. No injuries, which was great. And people don't get hurt with fireworks. There always seems to be somebody that gets burned. Something goes haywire. And, man, I'm one of these guys that lights it and I run. I mean, fast, because you don't know. These things can be defective where they go sideways and they do crazy things. That's why I say it's always best to let the professionals do it. You can see that even professional fireworks shows go crazy. Case in point, they are out in Arizona. That was definitely not the grand finale that they were looking for, the big ball of flames. That's not very impressive. Kind of scary because you don't exactly know what's going to end up happening. So the EPA, they're in the news. And, you know, the Environmental Protection Agency, they're supposed to be there to protect us, give us um, valuable information as to what is going on with air quality, et cetera, or water and stuff like that. Well, Duke University, they're in the news, too. Duke University has admitted that one of its lab technicians, of all things, falsified or fabricated research data on respiratory illness that were used to get large grants from where? The Environmental Protection Agency. This admission came this uh, past Sunday in a legal filing that uh, that was responded to a uh, federal whistleblower lawsuit. Oh, yeah, somebody turned him in, which uh, the school tried to get dismissed. My former lab analyst, John Thomas, according to the Durham Herald this past Sunday, Thomas claims that his lawsuit, that uh, the allegedly fake research data of Aaron Potts, who worked eight years at Duke Medical School Lab, was used by the prestigious university and some of its professors to fraudulently obtain federal grants. Thomas also claims Duke tried to hide the alleged fraud. That is a shame. Yes, Duke University, prestigious Duke University. Now, Thomas is alleging that um, of all nearly all their work, Potts Kant did during her eight years at Duke University grants worth, and here's the number, $112.8 million to Duke and another $129.9 million to institutions like UNC Chapel Hill and North Carolina State University, according to the Herald. So this is woven together. <laughs> it's a lot bigger because it involves other universities as well. Thomas' lawsuit uses the False Claims Act, if you know what that is, that whistleblowers can use to notify authorities of potential fraud. Now, if such lawsuits are successful, the whistleblower can receive a reward. Damage awards can be as much as three times the size of the alleged fraud. Did you know that? Well, there's a quick way to make a little money for you. Potts Kant, who worked for now retired pulmonologist Dr. Michael Foster, admitted that she had generated experimental data that was altered. And to the extent she altered it, that she knew that the altered experimental data was false, according to uh, a lawyer responding to her. In 2007, here's, here's the deal. The EPA gave Foster a grant to determine whether exposure to airborne particles can negatively affect lung development in newborn mice. Pontus Kent operated a machine that gauged the lung function of mice to learn more about human respiratory ailments, the Daily Caller reports. That project was part of the $7.74 million environmental justice grant for a project that covered a period from 2007 to 2014. Now, researches from the project goes into the EPA data sets the agency uses to link respiratory ailments to airborne particles. Shame, shame, shame. But uh, it takes a whistleblower 
and maybe motivated by money, but to put fake 